This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson 6 from our series Present Truth in Deuteronomy is titled For What Nation Is There So Great? Ready for teaching on November 6 and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again as we open your word. Whatever day it is we're reading this lesson, we just thank you that because of it, we can get to know you better. We can get to understand you. We can get to understand our salvation. And we can understand more the need of those around us. We pray that wherever we are in this world listening at the moment, whether we're in Tehran or Toowoomba or Tenzin or Tokyo or Topeka and Tallahassee or Tonga or Tahiti or Lusaka or Lisbon or Bloemfontein, that we can have your Holy Spirit with us as we open your word. We pray that this week will be a blessing for each of us, both in our study of your word, but also in our own individual lives as we witness to those about us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 8. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Let's read that again, Deuteronomy 4 and verse 8. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? The first three chapters of Deuteronomy were basically a history lesson, reminding the people of what they had been through up to that point. By the time we get to chapter 4, the history lesson shifts more into a sermonic mode. The recounting of events wasn't just for history buffs. Instead, it served a purpose, showing the people the power and grace of God working among them, and that even though they messed up, the Lord was still going to honour his covenant with them. Chapter 4 begins with the Hebrew word, a conjunction and an adverb, we'ata, which can be translated as and now, or so now. They just had reviewed their recent history, a reminder of what God had done in bringing them to this point. Thus, or so now, they are to do what God tells them to do in response, as we see in Deuteronomy 10.12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's why the first verb that appears after the so now is shama, the same verb and in the same form as used in the beginning of the shema prayer. And it means hear or listen or obey, a verb repeated all through Deuteronomy. Thus the chapter begins, so now Israel, Because of what I have done for you, you must obey the following. Sunday, October 31. Do not add... Or take away. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What was the specific warning that the Lord gave them in regard to his statutes and judgments, and why would this be something that they are warned about right away? And we'll also look at Deuteronomy 12, 32. But first, Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And Deuteronomy twelve thirty-two, Whatever I command you, Be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. The Lord tells them to obey the statutes and judgments, and not to add or take away from them. Why say that? After all, 
Why would anyone want to change God's law? We know the answer, of course. And we read in Selected Messages, Book 2, page 107, Satan has been persevering and untiring in his efforts to prosecute the work he began in heaven, to change the law of God. He has succeeded in making the world believe the theory he presented in heaven before his fall that the law of God was faulty and needed revising. A large part of the professed Christian church, by their attitude, if not their words, show that they have accepted the same error. End of quote. When you think about the history of ancient Israel, you see that in many ways they got in trouble because not only would they ignore certain precepts of the law, which for all practical purposes was taken away from the law, but also they would add to it, in the sense of bringing in practices that were not specified in the law and that, in fact, led ultimately to transgressing it. Read Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. How do we see an example here of the principle that, though in another context, Moses warned the children of Israel about? Matthew 15, beginning at verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees, who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honour your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honour his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition." Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When the Hebrews eventually got the land promised them, they would often ignore the direct warnings about, for instance, idolatry. As a result, they followed many pagan practices, sometimes even as part of their supposed worship of Yahweh. By the time of Jesus, however, they had added all sorts of human traditions that, as Jesus himself said, made the commandment of God of none effect. Either way, adding or taking away, the law was changed and the nation suffered the consequences. And so to finish today... In what ways do we need to be careful about not adding to or taking away from what God tells us to do? Monday, November 1. Baal Peor. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, the children of Israel are given a bit more of a history lesson to function as a reminder of the past and of whatever spiritual and practical truths that they ideally should learn from it. And uh, let's just refresh our minds with Deuteronomy 4, 3 and 4. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Read Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 to 15. What happened and what spiritual and practical truths should the people have taken from this fiasco? Numbers chapter 25, beginning at verse 1. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. 
So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and those who died in the plague were twenty-four thousand. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite who was killed, who was killed with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a leader of a father's house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head of the people of a father's house in Midian. However uncomfortable we are with the stories of Israel wiping out some of the pagan nations around them, this account certainly helps in explaining the logic behind the command. Israel was to be a witness to the pagan nations around them of the true God, the only God. They were to be an example to show what worship of the true God was like. Instead, by adhering to the pagan gods around them, they often fell into outright rebellion against the very god whom they were to represent to the world. Though the phrase to commit harlotry often has a spiritual meaning, in that Israel went after pagan gods and practices, as we see in Hosea 4, 12-14, in this case the language and the rest of the story suggests that there was sexual sinning, at least at first. Here again, Satan took advantage of fallen human nature using the pagan women to seduce the men who obviously allowed themselves to be seduced. And Hosea chapter 4, beginning at verse 12, My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them, for the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. They offer sacrifices on the mountain tops and burn incense on the hills, under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters commit harlotry, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with harlots, and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore people who do not understand will be trampled. No doubt the act of physical harlotry degenerated into spiritual harlotry as well. The people involved eventually got caught up in pagan worship practices in which Israel was joined to Baal of Peor. That is, they somehow became attached to this false god and even sacrificed to it. Despite everything they had been taught and told, they were willing to throw it all away in the heat of passion and lust. How could this have happened? Easily by hardening their consciences with the first sin, the physical one, they were ripe for falling into the latter one, the spiritual one, which must have been Satan's ultimate goal. They had become so debased that, according to the text, one man brought his Midianite woman right into the camp itself, right before Moses, and before the people who were weeping outside the tabernacle. So to finish today, our minds and bodies are intimately linked, what affects one affects the other. What can we learn from this story about how dangerous indulgence can be to us spiritually?
Tuesday, November 2. Cleave to the Lord your God. Thousands died in the sin with Baal Peor. All men who followed Baal Peor were destroyed, it says. However, many didn't follow in the apostasy. Who were they? Deuteronomy 4 verse 4 reads, But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you, this day. How does this text explain the difference between those who fell into sin and those who didn't? What's the important message for us here regarding sin and temptation and the power of God in our lives? Notice the contrast between the word all in this verse and the verse before. All who followed after Baal Peor were destroyed, but every one of you who did cleave to the Lord were alive. There was no middle ground then, and there is none now either. We're either for or against Jesus, as we read in Matthew 12.30. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. The Hebrew word for did cleave, dibuk, D-B-Q it's spelled, often points to a strong commitment to adhere to something outside of oneself. The same Hebrew word root is used in Genesis 2.24 when a man shall leave his family and cleave unto his wife. Let's look at that text, Genesis 2.24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Or as it says in Ruth 1.14, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. It, in this context, appeared four times in Deuteronomy, and in each case the idea was the same. They, the people, were to cleave or cling to their God. First of all, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 20. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. And Deuteronomy 11:22. For if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him. And Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice. You shall serve him, and hold fast to him. And Deuteronomy 30 verse 20. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. And that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. That is, they were to give themselves to him and to draw power and strength from him. What's important to remember is that the people themselves are the subject of the verb. They must do the cleaving. They must make the choice to cleave to God and then, in his power and strength, to avoid falling into sin. Read Jude 24 and 1 Corinthians 10.13, what is being said here in the New Testament that also is found in Deuteronomy 13 verse 4. Let's just read Deuteronomy 13.4 first. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. So Jude 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but, with the temptation, will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. God is faithful. God is able to keep us from falling, but we have to make the conscious choice, as did the faithful of Baal Peor, to cleave to God. If so, then we can be assured that, whatever the temptation, we can remain faithful. So to finish today, how do such things as prayer, Bible study, worship and fellowship help us cleave to the Lord?
Wednesday, November 3. For what nation is there so great? What follow in the next few verses after Deuteronomy 4.4 4 are some of the most profound and beautiful texts in all Scripture. The Hebrew is magnificent. One could argue that, in essence, the message of Deuteronomy is found right here, and everything else is commentary. As you read these texts, think about various ways the principle here could be applied to us today as well. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 to 9. Why would the Lord through Moses have said what he did here to Israel? Deuteronomy 4, beginning at verse 5. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you today? Only take heed to yourself, and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. The Lord wants the people to realise that they have been called, chosen for a special reason. They are a great nation, just as God had called Abram, right before the first call out of the Chaldees, that I will make you a great nation, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. Also, we're going to look at Genesis 18, verse 18. So Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. But the purpose of making them great was that they could be a blessing, as it says in verse 2 of chapter 12, to all the families of earth, as it says in verse 3. Let's read both those verses. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And though the ultimate blessing would be that Jesus, the Messiah, would come through their bloodline, until then they were to be the light of the world. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth, we read in Isaiah 49 verse 6. Not that salvation was found in them, but that through them the true God, who alone can save, was to be revealed. Israel was worshipping and serving the God who created the cosmos, the Lord of heaven and earth. The pagans were worshipping rocks, stones, wood and demons, as we read in Deuteronomy 32.17. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not hear. And Psalm 106, verse 37. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. What a stark difference. In these verses, Moses pointed to two things that made Israel special. First, the Lord was near to them, as he was in a unique way, such as through the sanctuary. And second, as it says in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 4, the statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. What else was the Lord saying to them that should have made them realise what a special calling they had been given? Deuteronomy 4, beginning at verse 32. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether any great thing like this has happened, or anything like it has been heard. 
Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and live? Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him." No question, Israel had been given so much. Now, how would they respond? Thursday, November 4. Your Wisdom and Your Understanding. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 9, as we saw, was a powerful expression of not merely the nation's special status, but of its missionary calling as well. Woven all through these verses is the idea that they need to obey, to follow, to do what the Lord commands them to do. Read again Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. What specifically does the Lord say is their wisdom and understanding in the eyes of these nations? Deuteronomy 4 verse 6 Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. At first glance, it might seem as if the statutes and judgments themselves are what contain the wisdom and understanding. But that's not what the text says. The Lord had taught them statutes and judgments, yes, but their wisdom and understanding came from their keeping them, from their obeying them. Their obedience, that was their wisdom and understanding. Israel could have had the most wonderful system of law and rules and regulations the world had ever seen. In fact, it did. But what good would it all be if Israel didn't follow it? Instead, their wisdom, their understanding, came from the real-time manifestation of God's laws in their lives. They were to live out the truths that the Lord had given them, and they could do that only by obeying them. All the light and all the truth wasn't going to do them or the pagans around them any good if Israel didn't live out the truth. Hence, again and again, they were called to obey because their obedience to the statutes and judgments, not the statutes and judgments themselves, was what mattered in terms of being a witness to the world. In Christ's Object Lesson, page 288, we read, Their obedience to the law of God would make them marvels of prosperity before the nations of the world. He who could give them wisdom and skill in all cunning work would continue to be their teacher and would ennoble and elevate them through obedience to his laws. If obedient, they would be preserved from the diseases that afflicted other nations and would be blessed with vigour of intellect. The glory of God, his majesty and power were to be revealed in all their prosperity. They were to be a kingdom of priests and princes. God furnished them with every facility for becoming the greatest nation on the earth. End of quote. And so to finish today, read Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 to 16. In these verses, what is Jesus saying to us that reflects the same thing he had said to ancient Israel? How especially should this apply to us as Seventh-day Adventist? Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are a light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven.
Friday, November 5. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God, writes Ellen White in The Great Controversy, page 582. She continues, it was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator, and though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. To deceive men, and thus lead them to transgress God's law, is the object which he has steadfastly pursued. Whether this be accomplished by casting aside the law altogether, or by rejecting one of its precepts, the result will be ultimately the same. He that offends in one point manifests contempt for the whole law. His influence and example are on the side of transgression. He becomes guilty of all, as it says in James 2.10. End of quote. Concerning Baal Poor, Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 454, They ventured upon the forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan, Beguiled with music and dancing, and allured by the beauty of heathen vestals, they cast off their fealty to Jehovah. As they united in mirth and feasting, indulgence in wine beclouded their senses, and broke down the barriers of self-control. Passion had full sway, and having defiled their consciences by lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. They offered sacrifice upon heathen altars and participated in the most degrading rites. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Think about the ways in which we Seventh-day Adventists are in the place where ancient Israel was. Think about all that we have been given in contrast to the world around us, and yes, even in contrast to other churches. The question for us then is this. How are we responding to what we've been given? How well are we projecting our wisdom and understanding before the world? 2. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Again, the subject of the verb did cleave is the people. The Lord won't cleave to us in the sense that he won't force us to himself. Instead, using the sacred gift of free will, we have to choose to cleave to Him. Once we make that choice, how do we follow through and cleave to Him? And three, dwell more on the question at the end of Sunday study. What does it mean to add to or to take away from God's commands? Outside of the obvious, such as the attempted change of the Sabbath, how might something like that happen so subtly we don't even realise what is happening? Inside Story our mission story this week is titled, What Kind of Book Is This? It's by Aiki Saito. A stranger handed a Bible to the 12-year-old girl as she walked home from school in Japan, but she wasn't interested and placed the book on a shelf in her bedroom. Later, as she cleaned her room, she saw the Bible on the shelf and felt a strong desire to give it to her 8-year-old brother, Ryotaro. Would you like to read this? she asked. Ryotaro wondered what kind of book she was holding. When he looked more closely, he read the word Bible on the cover. He had seen a Bible at his grandfather's house, and he was curious about what kind of book it might be. Yes, I'd like to read it, he said. The Bible was his. The Bible contained only the New Testament, and he started reading from the beginning, the Gospel of Matthew. Who was Matthew, he thought. As he read, he learned about a man named Jesus who healed many sick people. He realized that Jesus was a great person. When he finished Matthew, he wondered what would happen next. So he started reading the next book, Mark. But the story sounded familiar to what he had just read in Matthew. So he quit halfway through. After that, he read here and there, but he didn't finish any book. 
He longed to know more about Jesus. His family was not Christian, and he didn't tell them about the longing in his heart. Meanwhile, the Bible became an important part of his life. Inside, he found a page with promises that he could claim. There were promises for when he was sick or having a bad day. Every time he needed peace, he read the promises and felt comforted. With a pencil, he underlined the verses that he liked. When he left the house, he always carried the Bible with him. Although no one ever taught him to pray, when he went on trips with his family, he always prayed, God, please protect us. When he finished elementary school, he decided to go to Okinawa Senekus Junior High School, a Seventh-day Adventist school that father and mother found on the internet. He hoped to learn more about Jesus, and he is. Today, Reotaro is 12 and living in the boys' dormitory at the school. Not long ago, he announced to his parents that he wanted to be baptised. Riataro, whose picture appears on the left here, learned about the Adventist school through the internet. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to a project to help many Japanese people, especially young people, learn about Jesus through the internet. Thank you for planning a generous offering. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.